Well, praise the Lord, everyone. Um, this is Mac and Myra, and here we are on another Sunday. I kind of like this view. It looks like we're a little closer and connected, and I do like being connected to you. Um, but we are really excited. I'm, I know Myra doesn't even know why we should be excited. But the excitement is, is that this will be our last uh, sharing on Facebook Live in Guatemala until June. And so the next time you see us, you'll see a different background and everything like that. So we're kind of uh, bidding a, a, I guess, a, a farewell uh, to our beloved Molino, where we live, um, in the department of Chiquimula in Guatemala. And we have had a wonderful time here since the month of December. I'm going to say right up front before I turn this over to Myra that I probably will go longer today. I will do my best to not go too long, but there is a lot that um, needs to be talked about in reference to our subject for today, which is Psalm 34. And this Psalm 34 was submitted to us by Elizabeth Abel. I hope she has an opportunity to come on board and share with us live, but you, know, you guys know that um, we keep these on Facebook and eventually they also make it over to YouTube. So please, please, please support us. Uh, give us some feedback on what you think, how we can be better. Um, but other than that, I mean, we have just had a joyous time. And I've got to say this again because I do need to flirt every once in a while. My wife looks good, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I got the red lips and got the multi-print thing going on. I don't know. I hope we can get through this. Or better yet, I hope I can get through this. Um, and I will tell you why I'm saying that, but I don't want to get into this past week. But let's just say the week has been a struggle. Mm -hmm. And so it is just good right now to just share the same room with my beloved. With that said, my darling, we turn it over to you. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for another opportunity to show forth your love through the Word, because your Word is love, and it helps us to turn away from those things that are not lovable. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done for us and all that you are doing for us, for the name, in the, for the sake of Christ, for his sacrifice. We love you, we honor you, and we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Psalm 34. I couldn't even get through the whole thing. I'm just going to talk about the first four verses. And, and I had to stop there. Uh, this psalm is of David. Uh, he, had, he had run away from Saul, who was, the, who was chosen by the people to be the king the first king of the of the of Israel. And Saul had kind of gone downhill, was veering away from the things of the Lord, and God has set for a new replacement for him. And it was David, a, a young shepherd boy, who has a heart after God. And then during this time as David was being raised up and showed his value to, to the kingdom and killed Goliath and people were loving him and praising him more than they were Saul, it got very contentious and David had to run away. And I love his heart at that time because he didn't, he had the stamina and the strength to actually kill Saul and he had opportunity, but he didn't because he, he I think the scripture says, touch thy, you know, servant. Don't touch God's anointed. Don't do any harm to them. And he valued that scripture, and he didn't do anything to Saul on purpose. I mean, you know, 
he did end his reign eventually, but it was not in David's heart to hurt him at all. So he ran away, and in one of his adventures, he went back to the Philistines. <laughs> and he pretended he was mad, he was like he was crazy. But that didn't really work very well, so he had to leave again, and he wound up in the cave in, a, in Abdullah, I think it's. And yeah. in that cave, all these men came that were dissatisfied with Saul. And it's believed that in that cave, he wrote this song about all that he had been through at that point. And the first verse says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Now he's running away, he's hiding, he's being treated uh, badly by, by the Philistines when he was there, he had to pretend, you know, he could have said, you know, I did this, I, I was able to deceive them. But his thoughts were on the, on the Lord, even in the midst of his struggles, even in the midst of his storm. So I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. And we go on to 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And David showed forth that in his attitude, in the way he just kept blessing the Lord. Ephesians 5, <laughs> 1920. <laughs> it says, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you think about psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart, that was a very good example of David because he played on his harp. He loved to sing unto the Lord. And it's saying that we should be the same way because this is Ephesians. He's talking to the Christians now. He's talking to the body of Christ. So you hear in this world, you know, you don't talk about politics, you don't talk about religion. But it says he is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Do we do that as Christians in an ongoing fashion that people would notice that? Or do we hide that? You know, it just mm. doesn't say, you don't, you know, you don't just stifle the blessing of God to bless the Lord at all times. And then in, in the second verse, it says, my soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. And that took me to Jeremiah 9. Ooh, my eyes are getting bad here. And it says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, let not, not the mighty man glory in his might, nor let the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, Thus saith the Lord, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. He says, I am the Lord. And it's beautiful, the first thing he says is exercising loving kindness. And that's one of the things about God. Is we hear so much about, I'm not there yet, and the yeah. things I need to do, and... I'm only human, but he says, I'm loving you. I'm giving you loving kindness. Not that we deserve it, but because he, that's who he is. He's a God of loving kindness, but also judgment and righteousness in the earth. And that's what he delights in. But the first thing is loving kindness. And that should draw us, and that has definitely drawn David because he says, my soul shall make boast of the Lord. Because he says, God is everything to him. God is. We, we used to sing that song. Mm -hmm. says, God is. And then have all these different stanzas. God is the strength and the joy of my life. Mm. The, the words exemplify how he's boasting in the Lord. And how wonderful he is. And that's, that's exemplified who David is is but here we are a people 
which is really interesting. In 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 31, it says, But God has chosen the foolish things of this world. And do we think we're foolish? No. We think we're all this and, and a whatever. <laughs> but the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord I mean he had a purpose he said now we are the children of God but are we not glorified by ourselves no because we glorify him and that's where the glory comes from and that's what attracts people because when we glorify him we're putting our attention on him and then our spirit which is living within us the Holy Spirit shows forth the glory of God in our lives it's not to glorify us it's always to glorify him so David says my soul shall make boast of the Lord the humble shall hear of it and be glad why does he say the humble mm -hmm. because that scripture says the foolish and mostly humble people are foolish because they don't think about themselves or they think too highly of themselves it could be either way but I look at it like I'm nothing who am I I, I don't make good decisions. I don't do this. I can't do that. But with this glorifying God, He is glorified within us because we're glorifying Him. Because if we're mighty, which it talks about, we don't need God. We're sufficient unto ourselves. But when you realize how foolish we are, it should humble us. It should humble us to the point where we know that Without God, we have nothing. But with him, we have all things. And that's, that's David. That's his heart. And we go on to verse number three. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Now, that's one of my favorite verses because it makes me think of Mary. Bless the Lord. Poor Mary. She gets such a bad rap because of the Catholic Church, unfortunately, because they're glorifying Mary. But that's not who Mary was. She was a humble servant of God. And she had a song. It's in Luke 1, 46 to 49. It's a portion of it. It says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She's saying the same thing that David said. My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. She didn't say, I'm all this. No. She's heard the message from the angel that she's going to bear a child from the Holy Spirit. A holy entity unto God himself. And she says, he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. She's a servant. She's a servant. She says herself, for behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. But she's not saying I'm, I'm all that because she is blessed. Because in the Jewish um, history, every woman was wondering who would bring forth this child because it's part Old Testament that this Messiah would come, born of a virgin. So that was a privilege and a wonderful whatever, you know, who is this person going to be? And she was blessed because she was chosen. That's her blessing. That she was chosen. That's an humble blessing to bring forth this child. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. 
She got a left and right there. But she said, and holy is his name. Everything goes back to him. It's mm -hmm. not about her. It's about him. And in, in 30, Psalm 69, 30, it says, I will praise the name of God with a song. And then David is speaking, but Mary brings forth that song. She's carrying on that heritage coming from David because mm -hmm. she's from the house of David. This, his spirit, his dedication to the Lord went from generation to generation. Well, I, how many generations until Mary was born? But the spirit of God was living within them. I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. That's a wonderful heritage that Mary brought forth when she heard the good news about what she was going to do and how she was being privileged to carry that child, knowing that there would be some adversity because she's not married. Mm -hmm. And the first adversity was for, to, to you know, share this with Joseph and how would he take it? And we know the story. Joseph had to be told by an angel because he was about to put her down. It's like, no, he was a nice man. He wasn't going to get a stone, which she could have been. But an angel had to verify that she was telling the truth, that this was a divine appointment for her, assignment for mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. And with that, they went on together, walking the, a hard, hard path. Because her reputation was forever tarnished. They still talked about her. That she had gotten pregnant by a Roman soldier. It wasn't, it wasn't, definitely wasn't Joseph's. All these things she had to live with. But she says, I rejoice. I will bless him. I will thank him. I will sing a song unto my Lord. And then we go on to the fourth chapter, fourth verse of Psalm 34. And David says, I sought the Lord, and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now, we look at David, you know, he went out and fought Goliath, and he was standing for the Lord, and he had to run here and run there. And you think, well, he's young, and he's, he not, has no fear. But no, he says, delivered him from all his fears. Because he was frightened. He didn't know what was going to happen. He knew what his calling was. But he didn't, it didn't take away the fear that was in him. But God delivered him. He said, I saw him. I knew what, where to go in my spirit when I was fearful. And he heard me. He heard him. And the, the reference which was interesting to that verse was Matthew 7, 7. And it says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And I was like, okay, I need to work on that one. Because we, we tend to use that as, you know, I'm going to ask God for this and he's going to give it to me. And if I seek God, you know, but you, we don't even get to that, seeking and knocking. It's just like, I'm going to ask and I'm going to get it. I mean, he, they even use in Luke 11, 5 to 9, the story Jesus uses this about a friend coming at midnight. And being persistent, asking his friend's friend for something. He says, let me three loaves. And he says, I'm, I have a friend that's going on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he, the guy was saying, don't trouble me. I'm in the house. I'm, I'm resting. It's late. My children are in bed. And he kept coming back. He kept coming back. He says, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, Yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And that's Jesus because I believe it's hard sometimes to hear spiritual things in a spiritual way because our flesh just doesn't capture it. doesn't capture it. So he uses examples like that. But, you know, I look at David. And we know what happened in his life as he got older and his head got a little big and he did things that he shouldn't have. And he, when 
he realized through Nathan the prophet the greatest sin he could ever done was against God even though he, he didn't realize it until Nathan sent him what he had done he had, he had been an adulterous um, he had, had a, an affair with a woman he had a baby he had the woman's husband murdered and he was like I'm alright until Nathan came and gave him a story and he realized, oh, well that person needs to be, be punished. Kill him. And David said, you are the man. And it hit him. And what did he ask God for? We're going back to the ask, seek not. He asked God to restore to me the joy of your salvation. That's Psalm 51. And uphold me by your generous spirit. And then what can he do? Mm. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to me. That's what we should be about. Ask. Seek. That's what he's asking us to look at. Not the car, the house. And I don't have a problem with that. God has blessed us, and he continues to bless us with material things. But all that's temporary. But David realized that in his sin he had lost the joy of his salvation. He said, of your salvation it was the salvation of the Lord. And how generous he is to hold him by his generous spirit. Because the enemy tells us and, the, and people tell us, you sin that nothing's going to change that. Nothing's going to block that out. But it says he has a generous spirit. He looks at us and says, I see your sin, but I also see your desire to come away from that. When you ask, and you seek, and you knock, and you're persistent, I don't want to continue this way. I want to be the one that will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. That's what that means. It's all about him. All of that is about him. It's not about us. It's all about him. And he concludes with, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, oh God, you will not despise. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, lift me up, Father. Let me be that great man of, and woman of God that I can stand before the people and proclaim me. No, Lord, help me to teach transgressors your ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. Help me, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, because there's so many people in authority in leadership who are walking around with a lot of bloodshed because of their lifestyle but they're standing before people teaching, preaching leadership, we're in leadership because we have a platform but he says oh God, the God of my salvation, he's crying out and then I, and my tongue shall sing mm loud of your righteousness confession changing this is open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise does that mean we're going to be quiet no show forth your praise do not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ you are a Christian why are we hiding that because this is the time that people need to hear the truth this is the time Sinners need to be converted. The time is short. David didn't realize that his influence through the word, his sacrifice, his sin, his redemption, the things that he went through from being this bold and, and crazy young person who just loved the Lord with all this fervor, thinking that I'm just going to be his and then given a position of authority and fallen because of his flesh.
but mm -hmm. realizing that he could be redeemed, that his redemption was not over. God is, is a generous, generous spirit. And he, he was persistent in seeking that and pleading him to restore to me the joy of your salvation and being upheld by his generous spirit. Then he can teach the transgressors their way, his ways, and sinners shall be converted to you. That's what the body of Christ, especially in the leadership, that's what we're responsible for. Because the time is growing short, we're the ones that are going to be, we're the ones being persecuted. I mean, you can't watch anything on television. Mm -hmm. We're very careful about what we watch, but we can't get away from it. No matter what you watch, someone will say something against God, against the church, against anything that will, will uphold him. And there may be somebody in there that might say, well, I'm a Christian. And, but they ha always have a lesser role. The one, the role most prominent is, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. I believe this. We never heard that before, years ago, on television. It wasn't even thought about, but it's right out in front of us. And what about children learning? What are our young people hearing? What are we talking to them about as Christians? Are we upholding the word of God? Are we singing songs and praises mm -hmm. unto God? Mm. Are we hiding that? Oh, we can only do this here on a Sunday in church or Wednesday when we have Bible study. But when I go to work, mm -mm. when I go to work, I, I can't do that. And there are some that will say, praise the Lord, and then be smoking a cigarette or cussing, turn around. I mean, I used to smoke. I smoked after I got saved. But somebody came up to me and said to me, Myra, you're saved. I said, yes. I'm proud of it. You're still smoking. I said, you're right. You're right. So I went mm -hmm. home, and I smoked only at home. Until one day, just spending time with the Lord, seeking his face, in a quiet time, the Lord just spoke to me. He says, Myra, why are you smoking? I said, well, if I stop, I'm going to get fat. And he said, you know what? I'm going to love you anyway. I never smoked another cigarette. I was smoking two packs a day. Mm. That generous spirit changed my heart because he knew it was bad for me, for my body, that I'm supposed to take care of this vessel. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. But did he point his finger at me and say, Mara, my commandments for you to not smoke? No. He said, I'm going to love you anyway. And I knew that I, if I took another cigarette, if I smoked another cigarette, he'd forgive me. But I said, I'm not going to play with God like that. I might be, you know, scratching the walls. <laughs> hmm. But I never smoked another cigarette after that because of his love. His generous spirit. And that's what I see in, in these four verses. The generous spirit of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is alive in us. Mm. And David is just a precursor of that. There was no one else that spoke, that sensed the spirit of God the way David did. And he failed. But then he tried because he knew where to go. He didn't walk around with his, his tail between his legs. He said, restore to me, Lord, the joy of your salvation. He didn't hide in a corner and say, I can't do anything else. He said, because there's a work to do be done. I need to teach these people your ways. It's not about my position and who, how, what I look like. I have a job to do. People are dying in their sin because no one's telling them the truth. And they need to hear that so they can make a decision for themselves. But the scripture says, how can they hear it unless somebody preaches? And not necessarily in the church on Sunday. 
we, we preach with our relationships. We preach with our words. We preach with our hugs. We preach with our attitude. We need to teach transgressions their ways. His and ways. <laughs> his ways. <laughs> Amen. While Myra is sharing, you know, it seems like the Lord just always drops things by way of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, oh, I really wasn't going to do that, but I'm going to do it. So, I will bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that is within. As Myra was sharing, oh my gosh, I, I, told, I told her, I said, man, there's a lot of stuff going on with this. <laughs> See, she, she always leaves the hard assignment for me. She, she, she went through four verses, but I'm going to tell you, I went through the whole thing, but to also... Go to First Samuel 21 mm -hmm. because it is impossible to really understand why David wrote this psalm. Um, Myra is absolutely correct. It is believed that this psalm was written while he was in hiding uh, uh, in Adullam. And a lot was going on. She, she mentioned that he was fleeing from King Saul. And Myra also mentioned the fact that David had multiple opportunities to take Saul on out of here before we even get to this. Nevertheless, David also knew that God had allowed for the people to choose Saul. And Saul, the king, had been anointed by God. Never, understanding this, never was God's choice, but God appeased the people because God was standing as the leader of the people. And like everything else that happens in this world, when there's already an established leader, and the established leader of this world is Yahweh. But we always seem to need someone else to latch on to, someone else to lead the way. We're always looking for a deliverer. The children of Israel were looking for a deliverer. You know, when you go even today, everybody is looking for someone to deliver them out of the muck and mire of circumstances that are really self-inflicted into the marvelous light, not necessarily of Christ, but to get relief from struggle, from battles, from heartache, from depression, from anxiety, warfare, real warfare, uh, and also spiritual warfare. And when I was looking at uh, Psalm 34, I've got to be honest with you, I used to just really read that. I knew that, that uh, all the things that Myra talked about, about David having to pretend that he was insane and, you know, all of the, the things that led up to that, I, I was fully aware of that, but I never thought about actually connecting how Psalm 34 was birthed out of that whole experience because most people leave it at the first few verses because the first few verses of Psalm 34 are just about the worship and honoring of God. And, and, and you know, those are beautiful for our worship experiences when we assemble together. Um, they are wonderful even in our private devotion to just... Bless the Lord with everything that's within us. And 
sometimes we lose the essence of what was actually going on. So I'm going to, first of all, tell you, I'm going to go a little bit longer than the norm lately, but I think it's worth it. So, again, I can't get to Psalm 34 without looking at uh, 1 Samuel 21. And I just kind of made some notes to myself, and I promise you I'm not reading the entire uh, chapter, although it's only 15 verses, but they're 15 long verses. Um, but in essence, you know, there was strife between King Saul and David. And you have to understand that David was surely loyal mm -hmm. to Saul, so loyal that David was given privileges and had access to the king that was beyond what, you know, everyone else had, not to mention his best friend, Jonathan, was King Saul's son. So, you know, we would say to David, uh, you know, David was sitting in high cotton, you know, for uh, influence and definitely, you know, for potential succession. Uh, you know, David is the one who went out as a, a boy and slayed Goliath. You know, David is the one who was the worshiper. And in fact, if you really understand and have read through uh, lots of, uh, you know, uh, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, you know, we get a portrait of David where, you know, he's a shepherd or tending the sheep. You know, he's a worshiper, and so much so that he was so in tune with God that when Saul would have problems internally, it would be David who would come with the stringed instrument and ease all of the hardship and all of the anxiety, whatever Saul was going through. It was David that brought a holy presence into Saul's presence. And like many leaders, you know, King Saul is no different than the people that we promote as leaders today. Many of them start out on the great path. I believe, honestly, some of the charlatans that we deal with today, I believe that they actually, in the beginning, started out with good intent. But the more and more popularity eases in there, the more and more power and influence enters in, and the more and more money and opportunity for uh, promiscuity, when these things set in, these people that are often have been leaders turn out to miss the mark and they take their eyes off the prize and the prize is Yahweh and they settle for being their own gods, being their own best interest and they forget the meteor issues of serving God with gladness and coming before his presence with thanksgiving. All of that goes out the window and they then become instruments to try to lure people into a gospel experience that is not reflected in the Bible. This is what we're dealing with, y'all. I'm, I'm, today, today, I'm not calling out any names, but I'm, I'm going to put, be putting some programs together because I'm going to finally talk about some of these people that have just openly, with, with no fear and no trepidation, have been going against the good news of Jesus Christ. But anyway, in 1 Samuel 21, we have David coming to this place called Nob. And Nob is like, uh, it was like a, a, a district that was outside of Jerusalem. 
I see you, Dean. God bless you. I see you, Philip, as well. And, and it was at this place that he connected with Ahimelech. Now, in the Bible, you'll either see Ahimelech or Abimelech. They're the same. Uh, and this is the priest that he was having an encounter with. And, you know, it was an odd thing for David to show up by himself no protection, no crew, as we would say today. And so it is believed that, that Ahimelech was a little wary of what was taking place here because David had the look of a man who was a fugitive. Now, for you guys that, uh, I don't know how you, old you guys are, but there was two uh, movies called The Fugitive. Now there, no, no, sorry, let me take that back. There was one movie called The Fugitive. There was one TV series called The Fugitive. Now in the TV series, there's a guy by the name of David Jansen. And, you know, every week, I would do this. I would sit by the TV because somehow this dude, even though he didn't change his looks at all, but he would be going all these different places trying to find a person who had done some wrong to his wife, yet David Jansen's character was the one who was being accused of murdering his wife. And so each week it would be like, oh, he'd almost get caught, this and that. And I was like loving this thing. It was so, like every week it was appointment viewing for me. And then... Harrison Ford came out with the movie of the same title, and I like that one too. And same premise, and you know, with Harrison Ford, you know, he's a great actor. And so, I'm saying all this is because, you know, when you are a fugitive, you normally have a look of desperation. So, I can imagine, you now the priest is going like, what in the world is going on? Ahimelech is looking at this thing and saying, oh, what in the world is going on? And so David, realizing the circumstances, y'all read it for yourself, but David, realizing the circumstances and that he didn't want to be outed, you know, he came up with what I'm going to tell you is a bold-faced lie. You see, when you guys are talking about all the, the, the wrongdoings that David has done, we always go to Bathsheba. We always go to, you know, knocking off Uriah to get Bathsheba. But we don't talk about the fact that David really told a lie to the priest. To the priest, y'all. To the priest. All right? And, and basically, he was saying that, oh, you know, I'm... I'm, do, I'm on a scouting mission. I, I'm, I'm just scouting out things for King Saul, knowing that he was not doing that, but that he was in trouble. So anyway, um, I, I made a note to myself, wow, because when you relate this to Psalm 34 and what Myra said, see, we're seeing things in the aftermath. So let me tell you this, this nugget I believe I received, even as Myra was talking. I, the, the nugget I received was that the whole problem that David had and why he had to eventually write this in a cave, hiding out, is because he didn't put his whole heart in the Lord. He came up with his own concoction. See, guys, when you come out of your own stupidness, it'll make you praise the Lord because you can lie in front of the Lord. You can be whack, crazy in front of the Lord. And the Lord God Almighty continues to bless you. He has no reason to do it that makes sense to us Yet he does it. And this, I believe, is the, the, the answer in Psalm 34 to everything that David does to mess up. This is not even the first mess up. 
Okay, I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. But, you know, David is creating this crazy story. Then, after all that, he decides that he and the few that were with him needed to have bread, and specifically five loaves. Now, whether it relates uh, uh, whether it relates to what we would uh, understand as five loaves in the new covenant, I'm not going to say yay or nay. It was just a, a thought that popped in my head, which, which was that, you know, five loaves and some fish were what Jesus used to feed the multitude. And here, five loaves is what David requested of Ahimelech. Now, as the story goes on, they did not have what they call the common bread. The common bread was the bread that was for the community, for the public. All they had was what they call the show bread. This is the holy bread. This is the bread that, if consumed, should only have been consumed by the priest. And so when Ahimelech tells David that there is no common bread, Ahimelech makes his own decision, again, obviously not consulting God. You can get in a lot of trouble when you don't consult God. And he gives David and his small crew, he gives him of the holy bread. They also call it the presence. They literally call it the presence. Uh, and they begin to, to eat this bread. Now, when I was thinking about this, because again, I'm trying to juxtapose this to Psalm 34, and I'm going to jump ahead. I'm going to still cover 34, believe me. But doesn't it say in there somewhere, taste and see that the Lord is good? Well, <laughs> my mind just went, well, he certainly did. He tasted, mm -hmm. but he tasted in error. And the error was a Himalix. And so the priest was not supposed to be giving out this bread. And, and, what does that, or how does that relate to what's going on today? People, we are always pursuing the natural nourishment that has not been provided to us by God. We are being fed inappropriately by the leaders in houses of worship and they're feeding us a, a bread or a substance or an ideal or a concept or even a gospel that is not of the Holy Bible. And we take it in because we have the looks of fugitives and we have been on the run and we sometimes don't even understand what we are running from because see, if you don't even have a relationship or an understanding or even a small knowledge of who Christ is, you are just running from one self-made disaster into another self-made disaster. And it's just like, again, my favorite uh, um, analogy, like a, a, a guinea pig or a, a, a rat just running in the maze and just just going around. You know, back in the day, Billy Preston had this song called Just Going Around in Circles, you know, <laughs> and, and that's what's going on. And so as, you know, we, we continue on, and again, I'm just kind of shooting through uh, 1 Samuel 21, you know, at least Ahimelech had the uh, foreknowledge to at least ask if the people that were with David were they, you know, were they, uh, you know, people that were following the Lord, and David assured him of that. But still, it does not right 
the wrong. And so we have David with a lie and we have Ahimelech being disobedient to the ordinances of that time. Remember, we are in Old Covenant here. And so that was a major misstep on his part. And honestly, guys, I'm going to just cut to the chase. That would be part of what would lead Ahimelech to eventually be slaughtered along with uh, 83 other priests by the King Saul. So this is so critical that the things that we do, the people that we help, the, the, the circumstances that we try to navigate on a daily basis, we think that these things may only affect us. But honestly, guys, because this is a spiritual thing that's going on here, our missteps, our lies, our compromises, they hurt other people. And we need to be cognizant to recognize that no man, no woman is on an island. And see, and in 1 Samuel 21, what ended up happening is another dude that comes on the scene here. This guy is Doeg the Edomite. Now, this is critical. Because uh, Doe, the Edomite, uh, he's right up with King Saul. So see, while all this stuff is going on, you don't even know who's looking at you. And he's seeing all this stuff. And man, let's put it this way. David and his crew realized that they were in trouble. All right, because this guy was loyal to Saul. I mean, he was close, all right? And so this guy was going to go and let Saul know what's going on, and they would have come back and killed David. Remember, they're still in the place called Nob, and this is still right outside Jerusalem. So we're not talking about a whole lot of time here. So then, when this was realized, David, again, here's where we go into the second issue with David. Does it say anywhere in the scriptures that he then went to consult the Lord? Did he go to the Lord? I'm going to actually read this. Um, well, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but let me read this anyway. It says, Then David said to Ahimelech, Then have you not here a spear or a sword at hand? For I have brought neither my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. He, he is actually still in the midst of a lie, okay? Because he wasn't there for the king's business, all right? Then it, it says, and the priest said, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. Come on, y'all, listen to this. The sword of of Goliath the Philistine whom you struck down in the valley of Elah or Ella behold it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod if you will take that take it for there is none but that here in other words hey we talking about priests so they don't have weaponry and they should have had the sword and the spear, but you know what I'm saying. They didn't have physical weaponry, so that's the only thing that they had. Okay, and I would imagine that they had that there because that was a symbol that God would always defeat their enemies. All right, so it was a perfect example to have. And David said, there is none like that. Give it to me. He's saying, give it to me. So uh, then... You know, in the midst of all of this, David realizing that he is going to have to take off, he then goes into what Myra shared, that he would then have to fake <laughs> that he had gone insane. Now, honestly, guys, I have thought about this because I always tell people at the age that I am, which is 61, 
if something actually happened to me on them their streets these days, I would not be the old Mac that would just fight force with force. I would be trying to figure out a way to intelligently get out of that situation. And one of the things that I thought about is I could just act crazy and let all kind of spittle come out of my mouth and just ramble and do all kind of crazy things and pray, 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 pray <laughs> to God that <laughs> he would save me from my adversity. And so I, I get it. I get it. What I'm trying to say to you, though, is that we don't see here where David gave any thought of consulting this God, this Lord, who he definitely had a connection with. And, and what am I trying to say to us today? Even those of us who are strong in our faith, it only takes one instance where we forget where we come from, as we say in the hood. We forget whose we belong to, and we'll do our own thing and not consult God. We'll make decisions out of fear, out of trepidation, and forget to consult God. And that's what's going on here. And so then, in 1 Samuel 21, 10, it says, And David rose and fled that day from Saul and went to Ashish, the king of Gath. Now, talk about this, y'all. Going from a place outside of Jerusalem and going to the very enemy that you helped conquer. Okay? And so here he is with Ashish, the king of Gath, and the servants of Ashish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Did they not sing a song uh, uh, you know, one of another to, about him. And again, we go into, you know, Saul having his thousands and uh, David having his tens of thousands. And you, you got to know that they had to be looking at this uh, situation as being suspect. That's the word we like to use today. And that looks suspect. Um, but David took these words to heart and was much afraid and so he changed his behavior. I'm, I'm, I'm all over the place. He changed his behavior here, y'all, to act insane, to show that um, he wasn't there trying to be undercover and defeat them. Okay. But let me slow this thing down so I don't take things out of order. So anyway, that becomes another lie because he's telling a lie uh, in front of of King Ashish and his people. Now, this is where I'm going to end uh, the conversation related to 1 Samuel 21, and I'm looking at my time here. So give me about 15 more minutes, guys, maybe a little bit more. But now I'm going to bring this into Psalm 34. And so... I did just an overall reading, hopefully um, understanding of what's going on here, and I broke this thing out into different parts. Um, the first part, and I kind of did it from verses 1 through 5, are dealing with praise, worship, and honor unto God. Then the next part, which is from like verse 6 to verse 10, I put, um, we are going to struggle, but God will provide. So God is a provider for us. All right. So that's the second part. Because I'm telling you, when Elizabeth Abel gave us the whole passage, first thing Myra said was, ooh, that's a lot. And I didn't really think much about it. Until I actually had to get into it. It's like, oh, it is a lot. <laughs> so then the next one, the third part, uh, is talking about wisdom 
in the Lord promotes obedience and obedience promotes assurance that God will provide and that he makes provision for us. But it comes by way of our obedience and through wisdom. And you can be very smart with all the things of the world, but you can be spiritually uh, uh, dumb. Let me just say it. Dumb. An idiot even. And so we're always looking for the wisdom that comes by way of God because that wisdom will compound and uh, astound all the people around you. So then, the next section, which is basically verses 15 through 18, um, God is aware of the sinful nature of the wicked, and he also is aware that his people, now in the time that this was written, it was talking about the, uh, the, the Israelites who were faithful, but today it's talking about us, and he knows that we're going through. Janae, if you're still there, he knows that you're going through. Philip, if you're still there, he knows that you go through. Gina, if you're still there, he knows that you go through. He knows it, and believe it or not, guys, it's the best place to be because if you are not in the struggle, that means God's really not even thinking about you. Because remember, remember, Scripture tells us if you want to follow Jesus, you have to deny self, pick up your cross, that's the instrument or the situation of struggle, and follow him. When we follow him, we are going to go through. We're going to know that people are going to hate you for his sake. Not for you, Janae, but for his sake. When you make declarations like I saw you do this week, and you're talking about how good God is, God understands that you're going to get some pushback from people because they're not going to understand your faith. And they are going to immediately criticize you. Nevertheless, we are to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, and he takes care of his own. And then... Lastly, verses 20 through 22, this is the, oh my gosh, this is my part. I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but this is where we get Christ. Christ is revealed here, you know, and so it also reveals that God will rescue us. So isn't Christ the one who rescues us? All right, so now, and I think I'll get through it in a few minutes. So, so we know the easiest part is what we sang to get this thing started. I will bless the Lord at all times. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. We know how to do this. We do this in our edifices of worship every week, those of us who have to go to a location to do that. I'm glad you have to do that. For me and Myra, man, we sing it all the time because everywhere we go is the assembly. Everywhere we go is part of the church when we are connecting with like-minded people. Hey, since I saw Gina on here, Gina was here with a team in Guatemala. She came and they, they, they literally built a home for a, a woman and her children and family. And I'm telling you, it was beautiful. But what the really great thing is, is that you had Guatemalans connecting with folks from the U.S. of all different types, types of shades, all different types of experiences. And we prayed together. We sang together. We even cut up together. Guys, don't you understand that is church. That is congregating one with another. And it was outdoors. Do you hear what I'm saying? So, again, when we are 
worshiping and praising and honoring God, we can do this anywhere, at any time, at any moment. This is what it's all about. Stop allowing the systems of this world to keep you in perpetual bondage by saying, I'm going to church when we are all pieces of church. I see you, Toledo. So listen, we know how to do this. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us rejoice. We know how to do this. But then we have to go down into something in the midst of the, the uh, adoration that David is giving towards the Lord. He says, but it's a struggle. Okay? Remember, he's in a cave. He's hiding out. He's a fugitive. And everybody knows who he is. And you got Doe the uh, uh, Edomite knowing that he is on the run. And it doesn't end up pretty for those that are after David only because God has provided for him even though David has been in error in the way he did those things. But anyway, for us today, it's simply to understand, don't look at what you are going through. I'm going to tell you the honest goodness truth. I am so tired of people complaining that things aren't working the way that they want them to work. I am so worn out that people who tell me that they have a relationship with the Lord, they have pity parties. They are crying and they are questioning God. I'm sorry. That is not the makeup of people who follow the way. Because we see that the Bible presents God's perfect track record. If you are going through, he's allowed it. You probably are the one that set it up. So why then go to God crying, please help me, when you are the instrument of your own demise. And what we ought to do is going back up to the first few verses in 34 and just, I will bless the Lord. When people are talking about me badly, I will bless the Lord at all times. When people are cutting you down and firing you and discriminating against you, I will bless the Lord at all times. When people have lied and they have defamed your name, I will bless the Lord at all times. Guys, it is about a mindset and our hearts, how we deal in this life. And honestly, I never thought about this concerning Psalm 34 until I really got down and said, what in the world is going on? And why do we have these different transitions from this worship to the struggle and everything else? And so then, uh, you know, we, we can only address these issues when we go into the secret place of the Most High and abide under the shadow of the Almighty. It is there where we get wisdom. It is there where we find rest. It is there where we find purpose. It is there when we learn how to trust. It is there where we operate out of peace. It is there where we no longer look at our enemies in the flesh, but know that it is spiritual warfare. It is there where we learn how to fight these battles. We don't fight them with our dukes, and we don't fight them with guns, and we don't fight them with swords. We fight them with the word of God and with the holy presence. Not the presence of the showbread, but the presence of the Holy Spirit who is always with us if we have allowed him to be in our bodies and in our hearts. I'm almost there, y'all. 
We only get to this kind of wisdom by way of obedience. Obedience is better than sacrifice. We know how to sacrifice, y'all. At least what we call sacrifice, mm -hmm. which I don't really call sacrifice at all. Okay. Uh, talk to me about sacrifice when somebody has a gun up to your head and they tell you to curse God. And you say, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. Then I'll say, oh, yeah, that's sacrifice. So obedience. Don't y'all know that when we went from the old covenant into the new, we got rid of legalism. We got rid of the, 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 uh, the penalties of not doing the law properly. Don't ever think that the law was not perfect. The law was, is perfect. But God even knew there's no way that we could operate perfectly in that law. And so he used our Jewish brethren to give us the lesson. The ones that we call his chosen, okay, and he used them to give us, Gentiles, the demonstration of his love, of his love, and of his real law, which actually is more intense than the ones in the old covenant. But instead of just leaving us with two laws, he also allows for grace knowing that we will fall short of even those two. So if you think about it, if you love the Lord thy God with all that is in you, and then if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, and you can only love yourself because God loves you, because you don't even know what love is before God demonstrates his love. You didn't know what love is. You know what lust is. You know what liking a lot is. But love, okay, that's a whole different thing. So, God loves us with an intensity that none of us could ever demonstrate. And so he knows that we will still fall short. Yet, by grace, through faith, ha, he perfects us. And he looks upon us as his perfection. And when we understand it in that way, the moment we were born, we would never be perfect. But God looks at us through perfection that can only come by way of the blood of Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you guys, the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient to allow us to stop going around and still saying, I'm a sinner, or I'm a sinner saved by grace. No! Let me tell you something. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation of peculiar people. I'm tired of this, y'all. Look, look. Um, I had an addiction to alcohol. Now, I never, as an alcoholic, I never went to a meeting. I did go to them after my salvation, but I never went to a meeting while I was in it because God literally came into my life and literally took the taste of alcohol away from me. Now, if you're in the program or in the meetings, the first thing that they tell you to do is say, hi, I'm Lewis. And I'm an alcoholic. And let me tell you, I will not do that. Nor will I say, hi, I'm Lewis. I'm a sinner. No, <laughs> no, I will not do that. Because every time you do that, you are literally inflicting the same old, same old that put you in that place to begin with. If you have put aside every sin and every weight that will so easily beset you, 
You don't even uh, recognize that life any longer. I don't say you forget it, but you definitely don't dwell there. No, baby, I am a royal priesthood, and I'm out here doing my thing under the unction of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the high priest forever. Read Hebrews. So when you take it into this realm, then you understand that you're going to have to take on the struggle. You're going to have to take on the beatings. You're going to have to take on the negativity. You're going to have to take on just people thinking you have lost your Holy Ghost mind. And you know what? You're going to love it. And you're not going to complain anymore about circumstances. You're not going to have doubts. And you're not going to fall into the, the, the hands of depression and anxiety. Because God is able. And we will continuously praise him and worship him. Because he's almighty God. And he does not fail. Now, I'm going to close out on the favorite part of this. This is in Psalm 34, 20 through 21, but particularly verse 20. Man, oh man. Remember, I said earlier, this was a prophetic mention or acknowledgement of the one to come who would wipe away all of our tears. And that would be Jesus. That would be the Christ. It says in verse 20, he keeps all his bones and not one of them is broken. Let me go ahead and finish out. Affliction will slay the wicked. And those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. In other words, he buys that life back. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Guys, that's the reason why you ought to be in Psalm 34. I know we like, I will bless the Lord at all times, but I'm right here, baby. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. None of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. Let me go back to 20. He keeps all his bones and not one of them is broken. We talk about the humiliation, we talk about the cruelty and the physical abuse and the torture, because it was torture, y'all, that the Lord Jesus Christ endured for us. What we should talk about more is that not one bone was broken. Now, let me tell you, if you're, in the, if you're in the alley, in the shadow, in the dark, somebody pulverized you, you're probably going to get broke up, okay? So, think about this. This is in Psalm 34, written by David. Just happens to be the one or, or the lineage in, in which we would eventually get Jesus. And it's through this lineage that is being prophesied here that his bones won't be broken. But if you really read into this, in the spiritual sense, neither will ours. Neither will ours. Because we follow him, not of our own, but because we are followers of him. Yes, we endure similar things. Again, we cannot ever, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, take on everything that he went through. But we relate to him through our struggles. That's why we should not hate our struggles. We should not even, you know, honestly, 
ask for relief from those struggles when we know that they are there for a purpose. And that purpose you might never understand, but God knows. And if he's sufficient for you, you should move on and just trust him. And so, as I finish this, what does this all mean? And I don't know Elizabeth, because Elizabeth Abel was the one who uh, requested this. I don't know what you might have thought you would have gotten out of here, but I believe between the combo pack of Mac and Myra, I believe that uh, we covered enough to kind of keep you in the Bible for a minute, and we pray that God will reveal to you what this all means, how, how it relates to what, wherever he has you in your service to him. For everybody else who's listening, it's been a lot of folks, and I'm not going to try to read off names, but just know that, man, we love you guys with everything within us. With that said, guys, we love you. God bless you and keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. <laughs>